Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM-7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. I'm excited to have neurophysiologist and human performance coach Louisa Nicola back on the show for the last episode in a three-part series on improving brain health and cognitive performance. In episode 269, we discussed how exercise impacts the brain, and in episode 272, Louisa talked about how to leverage neuroscience to improve productivity and focus. And today, Louisa discusses how nutrition impacts our brain health and some shocking new research regarding the impact of alcohol on the brain. But before we dig in, if you own a wearable and you're tired of wasting time trying to figure out how to use the data to improve your health and performance, then check out AIM-7. AIM-7 turns your wearable data into actionable recommendations for your mind, body, and recovery so you can look, feel, and perform better. The app is in private beta, which means it's not in the app store, and you can only get it by signing up through AIM-7.com. And this is not just an app to download. You'll get four Zoom calls with me and my team to discuss habit building, adaptive capacity, and so much more. So click the link in the show notes or visit aim7.com to join the next cohort. All right, now for my conversation with Louisa. So let's lean in and learn from the best. Louisa, how does the food and the beverages, the nutrition that we can consume, how does that impact our brain health? So although this is not my area of expertise when it comes to nutrition, I do know a few things. We know that the most widely studied diet for mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease is the MIND diet, which stands for, if I remember, Mediterranean-interventional diet. So basically, what we know when it comes to the brain is that a diet high in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean proteins provide the best support for our brain function, and it can reduce the risk of cognitive decline. Conversely, which is a very controversial topic, is a diet high in saturated and trans fat sugars, carbohydrates can have a negative effect on the brain. And that's because, as we've spoken about before, the brain is extremely vascular rich. So we have blood vessels throughout our brain. And we often talk about overconsumption of saturated fat can lead to certain atheromas to build up, these little plaques that build up in the walls of the arteries, which then in turn causes atherosclerosis. But we can get this in the brain. We, you know, Mm. when we talk about occlusions or when we talk about a heart attack because of atherosclerosis, we're really talking about a stroke of the heart. We can get a stroke, a cerebral infarct in our head, which is called a stroke, which is literally an occlusion of blood flow in one of the vessels in the brain. So Mm. it's the same thing. So we need to protect the vessels and the pumps and the highways in our brain. And from having you know too much saturated fat, that's not a good thing. One thing that is really good for the brain is omega-3 fatty acids. We know that omega-3 fatty acids are extremely neuroprotective. They are the building blocks of the brain. Omega-3 fatty acids that come from fatty fish, like mackerel, salmon, these can help with the clearance of certain toxic proteins. One of the toxic proteins is amyloid beta, So I have quoted a study in RCT, which is the gold standard in academic research. I've quoted a study where they took Alzheimer's disease patients and they saw a clearance of this toxic protein called amyloid beta, which builds up in the brain of these patients over time. They saw a a clearance of it through having higher dose EPA and DHA, which is the two parts of omega-3 fatty acids. You've also got ALA. That's more a plant source. So staying away from four grams a day. Four grams a day, right? And yeah. it, it's improving glymphatic clearance, correct? So glymphatic system is like a sewage system in the brain, which right. means that our glial cells shrink in size and the cerebral spinal fluid can move around. This is activated during deep, slow wave sleep. So this particular study focused on not glymphatic clearance, it more so focused on the amelioration of these plaques. Okay. So just amyloid beta specifically. Yeah. Very interesting because I've been going down the rabbit hole on different things that impact glymphatic clearance. And one of the first things, there was a great paper that was put out I'll find it and send it to you, but it looked at four behaviors that impact aquaporin channels. One of them was omegas. Another was positioning of sleep, which I thought was fascinating. The side position? Yes, side position, aerobic exercise. Anyways, it was very interesting. So 
it sounds to me like essentially an anti-inflammatory diet is really healthy for the brain. Prioritizing omega fatty acids, making sure that we're, you know, we have to have some saturated fat for hormonal health. But when you have this blend of lots of saturated fats, trans fat, it's kind of like the overindulgence, the dose versus the poison. And the dose makes the poison, right? We talked about that earlier. What about alcohol. I saw a post that you did, you put out on Instagram, which by the way, I thought was phenomenal because of it wasn't your opinion. You were citing a really good study, I believe is in nature. Let's talk about alcohol for a second and brain health. Wow. So Eric is referring to a post that I put up, which said that no amount of alcohol is good for the brain. And it is true. And when I talk about the brain in this aspect, I'm referring to the structure and the pathological components rather than psychological components. Because I know that when we drink alcohol, it can lower inhibitions, it can make us feel a bit better. And I understand that. But as it turns out, our favorite drink, if that's your favorite drink, may be doing you more harm than good. So the study that I spoke about used a relatively large data set to quantify possible links between alcohol consumption and brain structure. So what they did was the researchers used a data set of around 37,000 healthy middle-aged adults, ranging from people who don't drink at all to people who were having moderate drinks. Moderate drinking was considered for women seven drinks a week. You know, it's that's lot. one drink a day. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a lot for me. I, I don't yeah. drink, but I know that that's not a lot for some people because some mm. nights on a weekend, someone might go out and they'll have three drinks on a Friday and a Saturday. That's six drinks just there in a weekend. And then all they have to do is have one glass of wine on a Wednesday and they've reached the moderate limit. So Makes it's not sense. too much when you think about it in that sense. But what they observed was two things. First of all, they observed negative relationships between alcohol intake and global gray and white matter measures, regional gray matter volumes, and white matter microstructure indices. What does that mean? That means that we've got both gray matter and white matter. The gray matter is the cortex and it holds all of our cell bodies, and the white matter it holds all of the myelinated neurons. So when you're drinking, you're essentially shrinking your brain. That's what it translates into more drinking, smaller brain. And the link was apparent to even just one drink a day. That's startling. It's really kind of frightening that they can have that type of significant impact on the structure of your brain, which you have to think would then impact neurodegeneration, right? Because if your brain is shrinking over time. Yeah, I tore this apart. And when I put anything on Instagram, I, I tear an article apart and I get the mm -hmm. pros and cons. When I tore it apart, buried within the text, something caught my eye when it came to the brain. It said that the effect associated with a change from one to two daily alcohol units is equivalent to the effect of aging two years. Also, the increase from two to three daily drinks is an equivalency of aging three and a half years. That's pretty frightening. So if you're concerned about your brain health, it's something that you just need to be educated about and you need to seriously consider. And it's your call. That's the beauty of about being a human and being an adult is you get to make the judgment call. But the evidence is pretty, it's clear. 37,000 people. I actually remember now as you're, as you're reading this out, my friend Pratik Patel, I don't know if yeah, you know yeah. Pratik. Pratik's yeah, a close friend. We were talking about this paper, I don't know, a year ago. I believe it came out or maybe nine to 12 months ago. And he was talking about these kind of jumps from going from one to two or three to four and the impact it was having on the brain. It's something you need to really consider. You could be doing all these other things great. And then just, just one little 15 minutes of your day could have a negative impact. Well, this is why I speak about the fact that I don't care if you're a bodybuilder and you're exercising. And now that I'm getting older, you know, I was an elite triathlete back in my day. So I, I remember mm. what it's like to be young and energetic and I'm going to do all the jump squats that I can. And I was like that. I was working out five hours a day. It was a job. And now I'm getting older and I'm looking back and I'm like, oh, I don't care if you can run 10 miles and you can jump high and you can do crazy acrobatic things. If you're not sleeping and you're not eating well and you are drinking, I have, do not care how well you can jump kick. Is that a thing? Is mm -hmm. jump kicking a thing? I'm seeing <laughs> I'm seeing the kids do it, uh, doing some wild things these days. Yeah, MMA especially. Is there anything, I've got a couple extra minutes here with you. I love your take because it's evidence-based. 
You're very practical. You're always straight to the point. Is there anything out there right now that's really gotten up your crawl when it comes to brain health or what people are putting out oh, there? Many things. There's so many things that really irritate me. But let's just stay on the alcohol thing to stay on theme. Mm -hmm. A really big misconception that went around was the fact that wine was good for us because wine has something called resveratrol, which can be seen as a longevity thing, like something that can you know help you live longer. And while David Sinclair may have proven that that is well and truly true, you know, and he rodents. was, yeah. And, and he was also <laughs> positing the fact that you can have a glass of wine, which he's big on. And I don't know why you can have a glass or two of wine a day because it has resveratrol. I'm so sorry, but the amount of resveratrol needed to get the anti-aging and longevity benefits would mean that you'd have to have around a thousand glasses, actually maybe a hundred glasses of wine just to get that small amount. So there's a lot of misconceptions on the market. And I think following people who have evidence-based advice is the best. And for those of you listening, I would just say this, give Louisa a follow. Anything brain health, neuroscience, she's a trusted resource. She has a phenomenal newsletter that I've been subscribed to, I think 12 to 18 months now. Mm -hmm. So I'm really careful about the things that I curate and that I read. And then what I really appreciate about your work is again, evidence-based, but you're also out there doing it. You're not sitting in a lab all the time, which is great. You're a applied practitioner mm -hmm. of this field. And so you're out there working with elite athletes, you're trying things, you're bringing that back and you're educating folks. And that's what I really, really appreciate about you. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show because you're somebody that I believe is doing wonderful things for those people out there on social media, those people wanting to learn and take care of themselves. So thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure having you on. I hope to have you back in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again for listening to the Blueprint Podcast. And if you love the show, would you please take two seconds and leave us a comment and review on whichever listening platform you are joining us from. The algorithms on these platforms rely on the volume of reviews to push the shows in front of new audiences. So if you want to help us reach more people, please take a second to do that. Thanks again for listening, and I'll catch you in the next episode.